You're listening to Let's Talk Creation with Todd Wood and Paul Garner, the creation show where we learn, grow, and worship. Well, welcome back to another episode of Let's Talk Creation with Todd and Paul. I am Todd Wood. And I'm Paul Garner. And we are back again. Um, Don't forget to uh, hit uh, that like button or uh, leave us a nice review. Leave us a nice comment. Anything you can do to interact with our With our episodes, we very much appreciate that. If you have to unlike us, that's fine too. We don't care. There's always, there's always the one, Paul. You know, there's always that one (laughs) on every video that unlikes us. What are you gonna do? I suspect it's the same person. No, you can't win them all. (laughs) Well, all right. This episode, Paul, we're going back to our intermittent series. You remember, Paul? We have like half a dozen intermittent series of episodes. <laughs> we have. <laughs> Theme, themed around various topics of importance to uh, the creation world. Um, and, you know, we've got our radiometric dating series. We got our biblical chronology series. And we've got our series on natural evil. And I have my notes here. Uh, let me make sure I get them all here. So, so far we've done uh, three episodes, right? We had the introduction episode, which gave kind of a big overview of this. That was episode 49. We'll put all of these in the show notes for sure. Uh, then we had a uh, we had a really nasty episode about parasites. Remember interviewing uh, Jeremy Blaschke about that? That was, that was uh, episode 52. Um, then we had uh, an episode where we uh, explored the idea of God designing um, the world to be the way it is now as a function of the fall. Um, that was a hard one because it's a this whole subject is kind of tricky, but we thought that was important. That was episode 60. And if you want, we had another episode, um, you might remember back on episode uh, 46 where we interviewed um, Joe Francis. That was before we actually sort of gave this series a real name. But um, Joe talked about pathogens and and um, bacterial, viral infections and things like that. So that actually kind of fits in with this whole series as well. Now, you know that, that this, this, this series is, well, we kind of made it a series, right? Because it's so big. Um, the, there's, there's biblical dimensions, there's, there's textual dimensions of what it says in Genesis and what it teaches in the Bible. There are dimensions of biology regarding, you know, what exactly are we talking about with this, this whole natural evil idea. And of course there are the big philosophical dimensions, which are, you know, what is the problem of evil? How do we address the problem of evil? Uh, all that kind of stuff. This time we're going back to biology, though, and it's going to be kind of an expansion on the last, uh, the last episode because <laughs> last episode we did right. We did the one designed to kill, right, where we talked about the jolly bear and the grumpy bear and how it was sort of you could imagine shifting back and forth between those. But there, there are certain things in the world that are just they seem to be evil all the time, and it's really hard to imagine how. They could be nice. And we mentioned rattlesnakes in that last episode. And I got an email shortly after that that said, you haven't even scratched the surface of the amazingness of rattlesnakes. So uh, naturally, I said, well, you should come on the show and tell us all about it. So here we go. This week, we're talking rattlesnakes with a rattlesnake expert. Our guest is uh, Aaron Corbett who is a professor of biology at Southern Adventist University. Welcome, Aaron. Oh, good to be here. Good to be here. Yeah. It's great to have you, Aaron. So let's just clarify this for our audience here. Um, we, we, we've we named you a rattlesnake expert. You, that was your dissertation work, right? I mean, that for your, for your doctoral work, you were studying rattlesnakes. Yes, I did. So, yeah, there's kind of two sides to my dissertation work. So, one side was actually conservation biology of rattlesnakes, and I was actually doing radio telemetry. So, I would uh, go out. Um, these are largely from people. I was plastering homes in this is in Loma Linda, California, with flyers saying, "If you see a rattlesnake, 
call me and I would get those rattlesnakes and put a radio transmitter in them. So this is like a battery sized um, uh, transmitter. There's a long antenna that's maybe, I don't know, six inches, something like that. And do a surgery on the snake, cut it open, insert this uh, transmitter into its body cavity, sew it back up and let it go. And what you can do then is you can uh, get a directional antenna, which, um, and each, yeah, those transmitters, they emit a frequency at a specific wavelength or specific frequency for each snake. So you sort of dial up your snake, set your receiver to the particular frequency. And when the directional antenna, you can hone in on it. So it get, you get a larger signal when you point it in the direction of the snake. So I was hiking all over the hills, finding my snakes. And then once I found the snake, I could take a GPS point. I was actually in that part of my research looking to see how to conserve these snakes. Because the snake I was researching is called a red diamond rattlesnake. Okay. And they're a species of special concern in the state of California. And so... The question was, if this snake shows up in someone's backyard, what's the best way to deal with it? Right. Uh, we kind of don't want to kill it because it's protected. Uh, so, But if we move it, is it going to come back? If I move it too far, does that mean it doesn't know where it is? And then it just doesn't know where the resources are. And then it just starves to death or something like that. So those are the kinds of questions. So I was taking the snakes and moving them either a short distance or a long distance away. And then seeing if that if they came back. Uh, what their movement patterns were, um, and if it was affecting, let's say, their mortality, yeah, that kind of stuff. And then the other side was uh, actually looking at how snakes impact people in terms of medicine. So I reviewed so 354 medical records of snake bite victims at Loma Linda University and was looking for things like what predicts the severity of a bite, oh. um, who gets bit, that kind of stuff. Um, so, yes, I've handled my share of rattlesnakes. Yeah. <laughs> Chased them all over the hills so, of Loma Linda. So you are quite literally a snake handler. That's pretty cool. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've even handled snakes in churches, but, you know, oh. not. <laughs> not not that way. <laughs> not not in the Pentecostal way. Have yeah. you have mm. you been, have you had the unpleasant experience of actually getting bitten? Oh, boy, I have to hang my head in shame and say, yes, I did. Oh, I did get bit wow. once. Um, it's because I was an idiot. That's usually, it's always, you know, my yep, fault because I didn't handle it how I should have. And it was actually a, uh, a few days old, rattlesnake. Um, I, part of my research, it kind of was a failed end. Um, but one of the things I was trying to do was, uh, track movement patterns of baby snakes. See how wow. that's different from adults. Yeah. And so I had a couple of my uh, snakes I had transmitters in, I knew were female and it was about, and I knew they were gravid because when I see them, I'd see, oh, you look a bit swollen. And so they were pregnant and I brought them into my lab and they gave birth and we were holding them in the lab for a little while because, you know, rattlesnakes do do a little bit of parental care. So the babies, they give live birth, they don't lay eggs. And when the babies come out, they hang out with their mother for a couple of weeks till they shed their skin the first time. And then they're off on their own, but the mother actually does a little bit of parental care. And so I was having them in my lab, uh, just looking after them until they shed the first time. And that's when I was going to try and glue a transmitter on them because surgery on a tiny snake, it it's just isn't going to work well. And so then I, um, yeah, it's in that process. And I'm trying to open up these little shoebox like plastic containers. And yeah, it kind of got away from me. And it, yeah, got that thumb right there. So it's, it's fine. Still there. It still looks like say. a thumb. Yeah, it's still yeah, there. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was, yeah. Um, it is interesting, the venom on those snakes. They do, uh, there's di lots of different toxins in snake venom. They do lots of different things too physiologically. And different snakes have different types of toxins that do different things. Uh, red diamond rattlesnakes uh, seem to be, in the research I was involved in, tend to cause a uh, blood to stop clotting that kind of stuff oh yeah mm -hmm. so it wasn't so mm -hmm. much tissue damage on my thumb it's my blood stopped clotting and that kind of stuff mm. so Nasty. yeah i spent some time got some antivenom and yeah so, the so i don't recommend it don't no. get bit it's not a good thing <laughs> but a small snake i would imagine delivers a small dose right 
Is that right? Yeah, that's that's true. There is this myth that circulates around at least uh at least over here in the US that is the smaller snakes are worse. And actually my data that I collected shows the opposite. The bigger the snake, the more venom it has, the worse the bite is. Okay. Mm. Yeah. So, what else did your research show, uh, Aaron? I'm, I'm, I'm kind of intrigued. You know, what do people do if they find one of these snakes in their backyard? So, yeah, the big thing we're looking at is what we call translocation. So, if a snake shows up in your backyard, uh, what would uh, like an authority want to do with it? Like, if they call somebody, right? What should they do with it? In different parts of the, uh, like the U.S., it's actually um, you might want to do different things. Right, so over here, where we currently are, with me and Tardar in Tennessee, um, we have timber rattlesnakes, and studies on those show if you move them a long distance away, they tend to die. And the reason for that is that uh, it gets cold over here, and if it freezes, that'll kill a snake. And so the snakes over here, the rattlesnakes, have to know where a den site is to get down underground below the frost line to survive. And if you move them a long distance away, then there's a good chance they won't know where to find a den site and they'll freeze to death. Mm. Uh, in California, it was quite a bit different. I didn't detect any difference in mortality between the snakes I translocated a long distance away versus the snakes that I, I left close to where uh, they probably were familiar with. And so for California, I think my research was suggesting that maybe moving the snake might be a useful thing to do. You Mortality didn't seem to be higher. Uh, there was a lower probability of the snake returning the further you moved it away. And so it might be a useful option in Southern California where it doesn't freeze. Right. Um, yeah. So when snake gets cold, you know, it can, it can reduce its body temperature quite a bit. It gets really lethargic, but it's not going to die. So mm -hmm. I had some days where the cold temperature at night in California and I get out there early in the morning because I'm trying to track snakes before it's really hot, <laughs> just because it's hot and uncomfortable. And yeah, I remember finding a snake uh, that just hadn't bothered finding a, usually they were ground squirrel burrows where I was that they were crawling in. It just hadn't bothered. And it was just sitting there on the ground, cold, barely moving. <laughs> but yeah, warmed up. It was fine. Moved on. There you go. Interesting. Snakes are resilient <laughs> like that. Yeah. 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 So, so brief story here about what to do with snakes. I, I, when I was a professor at Bryan College, um, working in their um, natural history museum, we had a massive collection of uh, snakes, most of them um, separated from their bodies. Their heads were separated from their bodies. So, um, it seemed to me that mostly what people would do in this area would be they would find the snake. Whether it was a copperhead or a or whatever a rattlesnake, and they would whack its head off with some implement and then bring the bring the remains to the museum there. That's not necessary, I would say. Is that right? You, I mean, we can't move them, but what else could we do with them besides just killing them? Um, boy, that's kind of a, a tough question. I mean, yeah. uh, here here's the issue. Uh, if you interact with a rattlesnake, that's when people get bit. So, in when I was looking at, uh, you know, looking at all these medical records and stuff, there's sort of two types of bites I was classifying. And one was called a legitimate bite, which is somebody who didn't see the snake, wasn't trying to interact with it, but just stumbled across it somehow and got bit. Right. And we call that a legitimate bite because the person isn't trying to, you know, interact with the snake. They just stumble across it, don't yep. see it, get bit. Right. Yep. Uh, the other kind are what we call the illegitimate bites, which are people are trying to do something with the snake, right? Yeah. And those are the people, yeah, they tend to get bit. Uh, in my study, alcohol tend to be involved more often than not. And the people getting bit, by and large, were males. So oh, it's guys surprise. are the ones that want to <laughs> yeah. mess with the snake. Yeah. All right. So I often say that when it comes to handling snakes, there are two dangerous chemicals. And one is alcohol, and the other is testosterone. testosterone yeah. <laughs> uh, so if yeah, you, those are the people, yeah. Slightly tipsy and male, leave the snake alone. Yeah, there's some, <laughs> I've read some crazy case studies of people. So one guy's drunk, has a pet, Western Diamondback Rattlesnake. And yeah, these snakes, 
when they get agitated, rattlesnakes do this thing with a tongue. I don't know. They they will um, stick their tongue out and leave it out, and then put way over their head and down below. And if I'm reading between the lines, this is what was happening. So the snake was coiled up, and there's a drunk guy looking at it, and he sees doing this weird thing with his tongue. He gets down and tries to mimic what it's doing with its tongue. Oh, and the snake bites him on the tongue. Oh. That was a, it's a crazy case study. Oh. And of course, the in, in Western Diamondbacks and some of those species, it tends to make you swell. Most rattlesnake bites, you swell because um, there's tissue damage and all kinds of stuff. And so the big thing that uh, in the in the this case study is trying to keep this guy alive because the tongue is swelling, the venom's traveling down the lymphatics into the neck, and so they had to do something to keep his airway open, or his airway would have swollen shut. And in the paper, they managed to shove in what they call a nasal airway, so it's a tube down the nose into the windpipe, just to keep his airway open, and. Um, they managed to, and the antivenom worked, and he was fine. But there you go. He was fine. He was traumatized. Well, I don't know. He, he was, was, yeah, he was traumatized. But there you go. I just, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Alcohol and handling venomous snakes yeah. d- just don't, yeah. just doesn't mix. Bad combination. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so, yeah. So let's talk a little bit more about this stuff. So, how, how, what kind of, what kind of snake diversity do we have here with these rattlesnakes? I mean, I don't really even know how many species there are. I kind of vaguely know a little bit about the family level, but I really don't know how yeah, many species of rattlers there are. Yeah, so rattlesnakes are purely like a new world species. Okay. So you get them going from, well, especially on the west side, it's just the southern part of Canada, all the way down into South America. And you've got, let's see, last time I looked, which right. things always change yep. when it comes to taxonomy, uh, we've got about 40 species of rattlesnake. Wow. And then if you count subspecies, you've got about 80 different kinds. Um, so yeah, and in this this uh in the US, uh the state with the most is Arizona, where you've got, I don't know, is it 20 some odd species or types? Oh. Um, Mexico has the most species. Of rattlesnake, and then you're like just a few as you move down into Central and South America. So it's quite a diversity. Wow. Um, some are small little things. Yep. They call these montane rattlesnakes. I've seen some of those in the kind of the what they call the Sky Islands, which are these mountains in southern Arizona, close to the Mexican border. And there are these little rattlesnakes. Some of my favorite. There's one. So probably my favorite is a ridge nose rattlesnake. And there are these little snakes. Uh, they're dark brown with these bright white lines on their faces. Um, some are, yeah, the other one that's pretty that you can find in Arizona, there's what's called a blacktail rattlesnake. And they come in various shades, but some are just bright yellow with dark black. And I think, yeah, they're, they're actually quite pretty. Quite pretty. So there is a huge diversity and some several different habitats. So you've got, you know, temperate forest over here with a timber rattlesnake. Lots of different species in more desert areas, but then you got some up on that. These are like pine forests and stuff up on these sky islands in southern Arizona. So there is quite a diversity. Wow. So is there? And you, the- you were, you were, we, we were just chatting, uh, Aaron, bef- before we kind of came on. And did, did you say there is a rattlesnake that is unique to Grand Canyon? Yeah, there is. It's well. a, yeah. It's called Protolus abyssus. It's the, yeah, Grand Canyon rattlesnake. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Amazing. So, yeah. So, so some of these um, snakes are very restricted in their geographical range. Yeah. And some are, yeah, it's interesting. Some of the ones in the Sky Islands, they're, they're separated. So they're just mountaintops. Mm-hmm. And you find right. different subspecies on different mountaintops. Yeah. Wow. Right, going from like Southern Arizona down into Mexico. And so, you know, you'll find some of these, like um, these uh, ridge nose rattlesnakes, and you can actually ID them based on which kind of mountaintop they come from. Some have more distinct bands and some have less distinct bands. And yeah, there's variation there. Fascinating. So variation speaking, speaking of variation. um, Yeah. So does this extend to the venom as well? I, I'm not really sure about all of the, I mean, I know there's like neurotoxins and I know there are, you know, hemotoxins. And so what do we have in rattlesnakes? What kind of variation is there? So the literature on those, there tends to be um, 
two major venom types that come out. And so in the literature, at least in the past, when I was into this, they were called type kind of type one and type two. And one of those is a more neurotoxic type venom. And so they have particular, the rattlesnakes have components, they're called um, phospholipases. Anyway, these are neurotoxins. And what they tend to do is um, chew on the cells, on the connection between the muscle uh, and the nerve. And they basically destroy the nerve terminal. And so what it causes is flaccid paralysis. So the famous snake uh, for this is uh, in California and Nevada and Arizona is called a Mojave rattlesnake. And Mojave green, except if you, they're not terribly green. But anyway, they have a neurotoxic type venom and it tends to cause some flaccid paralysis. On the other side of that, they're more, it's more tissue destructive, um, you know, uh, blood thinning type venom. And that's a lot of rattlesnakes. So they, there's tissue destructive components to some, and some are more on the area of stopping blood clotting and stuff like that. And it depends on sort of the majority of the, the toxin type within the venom. So, yeah, there is a diversity. And I mean, if you looked at snakes generally, there's all kinds of different ways that they, right. uh, proteins they have that do all kinds of crazy stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we could get uh, into, so, yeah, all the others, the adders and yeah. uh, the cobras and all the other um, mm-hmm. venomous snakes. So, so. Uh, yeah, so let's chat just briefly here about um, <laughs> what what good is a rattlesnake, I suppose. Um, what wh- what is it using all this stuff for? It's not just going around biting people. You you we've oh, already no, sort of es- we've already sort of established that uh, a lot of that <laughs> seems to be the fault of the drunken man <clears throat> messing with <laughs> right. the rattlesnake. So, yes. what would a rattlesnake normally want to do? with uh with its uh venom and uh, i guess they're pit vipers too so they're they've got some other um special oh yeah yeah. Well. yeah um so, so yeah rattlesnakes yeah yeah what are they, they do doing? belong to that they do belong to that pit viper group uh which has those kind of an extra sense they have that heat sense so they have these pits sort of between their nostril and their eye and they they can essentially see heat with those which is pretty wild um, but yeah, they're rattlesnakes and a lot of pit vipers. They seem to be, especially rattlesnakes, they seem to be cued in on eating things like rodents, which are warm blooded. So if you're, you know, ambush predator at night, you can see the warm blooded rodent coming. Uh, but the thing about rodents is rodents have nice, horrible, sharp, pointy teeth. And mm-hmm. so if you're trying to subdue a rodent, they can turn around and bite you, and that's not good. And so the rattlesnake strategy generally is to, you know, sit there and wait. You know, they're cold blooded. They don't have to eat a lot. They can sit there for days on end. And the rat, the rodent comes by, bam, bite it, inject your venom and release, let it go. Just like, I, I don't want to mess with you. You have sharp pointy teeth. And then they let it wander off and die somewhere. And then they do this behavior where they can actually tell the difference between uh, the scent of a rodent that it has bitten versus one it has not. And they can follow that scent to this dead rodent, and then it's like waiting for them there, and they'll swallow it, and there you go. So for rattlesnakes, it often seems like because rodents have scary, sharp, pointy teeth, they just want to bite release, not mess with it, and that's what the venom is for. Huh. So... So yeah, you you you're right. I don't know the half of it. This is the first I've ever heard of the these guys. They 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 can track the they can track, prey yes. they've actually bitten and not get distracted yes. by other rodents. Not to, yeah, exactly. By. Uh there's been some studies to try and figure out what exactly is the chemical change that's happening inside the rat that enables them to detect that difference. But they can do it. As this whole in the literature you'll find is called strike induced chemosensory searching that they'll do it. <laughs> and so after they strike, they start sniffing around. They're using that tongue. Yeah. And the reason it, you know, the tongue is forked. And the reason it's forked is they can smell in stereo. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. And so they, they will taste the air, except the sensors aren't on the tongue itself. Right. They have these vomeronasal organ up on the roof of their mouth that they're pulling there and then sticking it up inside there. But there's two passages in there. So, 
they can say, oh, I can detect it on this side of the tongue, not that side of the tongue. So I'm going to move that direction, right? So that's what the forked tongue is for. They kind of, yeah, smell in stereo. Yeah, this is amazing. <laughs> so, so they can, so they can detect um, the heat. So they can, in a sense, yeah, they can kind of see it coming see in the, the dark. rodent coming. Yeah, mm -hmm. they really quickly bite it and inject the venom. And I yep. imagine some of these snakes have enough venom that it's pretty much over for the rat right away. I think they're trying to give it the just the right amount. Ah. So that's the other thing when I was, you know, uh, there is, um, in the world of venom, there's this hypothesis that the venom metering hypothesis. And it's basically the idea that venom has a metabolic cost. Yep. It takes nutrients and energy to produce. And so animals are going to tend to be judicious in its use. <sighs> and that's going to come out. <laughs> so there's evidence that uh, snakes actually can assess the size of the prey. And they're going to say, oh, that's bigger. It needs more venom and give it more venom. Or it's smaller. I, I don't have to give it as much venom. Because there is sort of this idea that they want to return on investment, right? So if I'm going to sure. invest a lot of venom in killing that, I need to make sure I'm getting a good return. So I want to maximize that. So they seem to be able to kind of judge how much venom they need to give. And that might uh -huh. apply to the other side if we're biting people, right? So or a predator. I want to defend myself. Right, they don't really want to use their venom on you because that's a bad investment, right? I can't get my nutrients and energy sure, back right. if I bite you, and so that's part of why they might, you know, get up and do that rattle, and puff themselves up and hiss and whatever else they want to say. I don't, you know, I mean, technically, the first defense of any rattlesnake is to sit there and hope you don't see it. Yep. And the second is, I'm out of here. This thing is scary. And then if they only have the last resort, then I'm going to stand and try and bluff you. And even then, a good percentage of snake bites in humans are dry bites. Mm. They don't even inject any venom. Because um, you're not worth it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I just want to get you out of here. I don't really want to <laughs> invest my venom in, in, in you know, and yeah, deliver it to you. And so... Yeah, then, yeah, but then, of course, if they really feel threatened, it, you know, anybody, cornered animal, they're going to fight back, and so they'll use their venom, yeah. But, but well, once, once they've killed um, their prey, uh, I, I mean, I don't know how, how big a rattlesnake mouth is, but uh, how do they swallow? You know, they've got a big <laughs> oh, rodent, so how, you know, oh, a yeah. big rat or something, how, yeah. how do they swallow here, that? I've got a prop here that might help, oh. so that's oh, wow. my rattlesnake skull. Wow. So I don't know. Yeah. So um, the thing about snakes, which is cool, and I don't know, I guess pardon to listeners who aren't watching on the YouTube, I guess. Um, but what you can see here is they do have, they actually have two hinges on their jaw. So this is the back. Oh, yeah. There's a hinge right up here and a hinge here. So it's double hinged jaw. So they can open that thing mm. amazingly wide. Wow. And the other thing you can see here, is there is no connection between the bottom jaw. This is true of any mm. snake. They might have a loose little ligament there. Well, that means that they can spread their jaws out wide, flex them this way, those bottom jaws. Mm. And that's how they do it. And the other, the other thing is, is that, um, yeah, well, on rattlesnakes here, this is a pit viper, so I don't know if we get that closer. Mm. You can see there's that front part of their jaw here. That's a hinge, essentially. But then that's outside the, the teeth that are on the inside. So there is teeth on the top of their mouth. And so they're actually able to sort of stick their fang in, move it, and then shift their other teeth. And they almost bit this motion of walking the prey down their throat by shifting the position of those two sets of teeth. Um, and so that's how they kind of pull it down their throat. And the other thing that's interesting is you know, if you tried to do that and you had this thing lodged in your throat and it takes you 15 minutes or, you know, some of these big snakes, it'll take them hours to swallow whatever there is they're trying to swallow. You'd, you'd choke to death, right? It's stuck in your throat. You can't breathe. Uh, the snake's windpipe, its glottis, which is the opening to the windpipe, actually extends up into the bottom of its mouth and it sort of sits where your tongue is. And so they can actually stick it out the side of their mouth and use it like a snorkel while they're trying to swallow this whole thing. 
so they can still breathe and take a long time swallowing this thing whole. (laughs) So, and actually that made it that, yeah, that made it convenient. So I, I had an episode when I was doing my research. So, you know, I'm doing surgery on these snakes, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm actually knocking them out. I'm using sevoflurane and knocking them out. And the, this crazy thing is since snakes are cold-blooded, their metabolism isn't very high. So I could knock it out. It would not breathe for like half an hour. And I do the surgery, but then it, I had a couple snakes that they, they just weren't outgassing the, the anesthetic, right? They're the, yeah. And so I was actually doing rescue breathing on rattlesnake. I could take a little tube, get down there near its mouth, as this unconscious on front of me, because the glottis is up just inside the mouth, intubating a snake is super easy. Just stick it in there, and then I'm blowing very gently and watching the rice, trying to outgas the the anesthetic to bring the snake back. Um, so yeah, I'm one of those people to say I've done essentially rescue breathing on a rattlesnake. <laughs> You've done mouth to mouth. <laughs> On rattlesnake, That's, yeah, yeah, with a straw. Mouth on a rattlesnake, with a straw. It wasn't quite. Yeah, it was a straw. Yeah, it was mouth. a straw, but yeah, that's kind of yeah. What's, what's going on? <laughs> well, All right. Well, um, <laughs> th- th- there's one other thing I want to know, Aaron. I don't yeah. know what, what other questions Todd has, but it's it's about the rattle. Yes, yes um, that's what I t- want to know. Yeah, yeah so t- tell us about the rattle. I mean, how does it actually make that noise? Okay. You know, what is I thought the you might exactly? ask. I, I do have another prop here. <laughs> <All right. laughs> so I don't know. I don't know if you hear that on the microphone there. Uh, but yeah, this is a snake rattle. Um, wow. This came off a snake in, yeah, the snake I was looking after in the lab when I was at Loma Linda. Um, this comes from an eastern diamondback rattlesnake, a particular cantankerous one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I had actually tried to lift it out of its big kind of the giant fish tank it was in and it was not doing i ended up grabbing its tail to try and pull it out and he left this in my hand um (laughs) but okay so this the the rattle is basically a set of interlocking scales so there's a as a, a scale cap over the end of the tail and it's actually just the shape of it means that um Every time the snake sheds its skin, it gets a new segment to the rattle. So there's a new cap that covers the end of the tail. And because they're shaped in a particular way, they will interlock. And so every time the snake sheds, it will get another segment to the rattle. And they're dry, and they just sort of loosely connected because of their shape. And so they just kind of clack together. And that's what Mm -hmm. makes the noise. All right. And then they they actually have some amazing... uh, muscles in their tail that are actually designed to be um, high endurance. They're not very strong, but they're high endurance, and they're able to wiggle back and forth at amazingly fast speed, right? And so their muscles are actually designed to be able to carry on that for a long, long time, rattle, 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 without wearing out. And so, yeah, they're kind of, yeah. So it is amazing. It has to be a very particular shape. So one of the snakes hmm. that I track, I don't know if it got injured or was just sort of a malformation of the tail, and it never made a rattle. You could see the cap, but it wasn't the right shape, and so every time it shed, it would just fall off the end. And so, yeah, that's how those rattles work. Just this interesting shaped scale that covers the end of the tail. So, wow. so very interesting. I, I'm, I was told at some point in my education snakes are deaf and cannot hear their own rattle is that true it may be maybe Um, okay Okay. i i have i have seen mixed stuff on this um the basic idea is that snakes don't have external ears yeah they do have middle ears and stuff and the idea is that um those middle ear bones may be sort of connected to their bottom jaw, so they might be able to feel vibrations on the ground. Ah, okay. And that's what their kind of sense of hearing is cued into. Okay. Um, but they don't have external ears, and so the idea has been that there are certain frequencies that they don't hear well, including maybe their own rattle. Sure. Mm-hmm. Um, I have seen some stuff that sort of challenges that, and maybe they can hear more than we think they can. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that's the so yeah, that's the basic idea. So so the rattle then. 
just trying to wrap my head around the rattle here. Um, yeah. The teleology, the theology of the rattle, <laughs> if you will. Um, okay. So, so the snake is not, I mean, that's a pretty high pitched noise. The snake doesn't have external ears, probably not hearing it. This is just part of its, part of its, uh, uh scare tactic, like a cat raising its, raising its fur on its it, back. It seems to be that. Yeah. Okay. Um, there is an idea like in the standard literature, which I need to read a bit more, but there, there, I have run across the idea that this sort of, you know, evolved in the context of being in grasslands with big animals. And trying to tell those big animals, don't step on me, <laughs> was the way that the rattle came about. The other thing, though, that's interesting is there's a lot of other snakes that don't have rattles that still wiggle their tails. They wiggle their tails, yeah. Mm. yeah. Copperheads will wiggle their tails. I've seen gopher snakes wiggle their tails. I've seen, yeah, black rat snakes, which are around us here, Todd, yep, in Tennessee. Yep, yep. Those will wiggle their tails. And they seem to be doing it in leaf litter, and they seem to be trying to beat it against the maybe dry leaf litter, and that makes some sounds. So, yeah, for some oh. reason, just that different shaped rattle or different shaped scale on the end means that now I have some device that's able to maybe yeah. make a bit more noise. Yeah, makes a little more noise. And so, yes, so the yeah. so the 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 natural selection idea would be that the snakes that can make that noise, have yeah, maybe less didn't get fatal encounters on. with right with big herbivores than the ones that don't. Right. Yeah. Okay. And so they they leave their offspring. Okay, well that that's Correct. an interesting idea. It still always struck me as a very curious thing to build that massive that massive structure there, and not actually yeah. be able to appreciate it yourself, but know the, that. And the tail seems like adapted for it because they got those muscles there. It's oh, interesting yeah. when they move. Yeah, it's beautiful. They actually hold it at an angle up as they crawl around, and it they keep it from making noise as they move. Wow. It's sort of tipped up at an angle as they crawl and they, wow. yeah. Wow. So if they're moving around through the lift litter, it's making no noise at all. And they, they but when they want to use it, they have muscles that yeah. can it's handy. basically right there. Yeah, yeah. Do it all day without really running out of steam. All right. Well, <laughs> I, I've, I've seen that. So I mean, another, there's <clears throat> another species I worked with a little bit called the Southern Pacific. And I remember putting a trans couple transmitters in those. And those were definitely more, yeah, defensive, let's say. So I could find one, it sized me and it's rattling or whatever, and I could go down a hillside up another and I'd still hear it. You know, I'm like 100 yards away and it's still rattling. Wow. So it can be very loud then. I don't think I've it ever. It can be heard. loud and you can hear it quite a distance. Yeah. Yeah. I've never, I don't think I've ever. I mean, the rattlesnakes that I've run across, they were chilling, just laying out on the rock. And I'm like, I'm yeah, just going to. I'm just going to walk away because I don't really want to hear you. <laughs> <laughs> it's that yeah, drunk it guy like thing, I've, right? Yeah, different species you, you, you have different agitate it to that point, and then that's when they bite. So. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, wow. <laughs> I'm amazed. This is, you're right. This is way more complicated than, uh, than I had um, anticipated. So you you sent me a little bit of a uh, some thoughts on rattlesnake. Um, I don't know what to call it theology, tel teleology, design. Where <laughs> where do they come from? Um, and you had this list. I thought it was a very helpful list of some ideas that you had. There were five different um, mm. five different models of, that might explain things like rattlesnakes and and you know natural evil in general. Um, so I thought maybe, could you, do you have that handy? Could you give us the list? If you yeah, don't, I have it here. I do here. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, yeah. So this is from a paper that hopefully will come out soon. <laughs> oh, good. Um, yeah. Um, I wrote it, uh, this is years ago at this point for this volume and, uh, it seems to be slow going on getting everyone's stuff in to actually make it go. But, um. Uh, so yeah, my colleague uh, David Nelson, myself, and then another a theologian from up at Andrews University is the one we sort of got together and put this together. Okay. And so we kind of came up with some ideas about how you explain these sort of yeah these what we call natural evil, I guess. Sure. These sort of designs things that animals have that seem designed to kill things or stuff like that. 
Uh, one idea we had was secondary creation by God. So this is be the basic idea. So we have the original perfect creation in Genesis. And then after, you know, Genesis chapter three in the fall, we, God essentially recreates. So I guess you might have an idea of that. Um, in the in in Genesis, you have some ideas about, you know, um, when God curses the serpent, you have this idea that says, cursed, are you above all other things? So it seems like other things are being cursed at that time too, mm -hmm. potentially. And then maybe through those, you know, ideas of what happens, you know, it pronounces consequences for Adam and Eve. And on Adam, he talks about thorns and thistles as you're trying to cultivate stuff. And so maybe there is some sort of a reorganization or recreation, right? So God is reorganizing life to account or to handle um, the entrance of sin in the world or something like that. And so maybe some of these adaptations we see are actually created by God is the implication there. Uh, and sometimes I, I wonder about that because uh, when you look at ecology, what you find is that um, ecosystems that are intact, that have top predators and things like that, tend to be more biodiverse. Um, mm -hmm. And you can see that there's a the, um, the paper I'm remembering is, is this one, it's in nature, I forgot the author, it's called The Trophic Downgrading of uh, Ecosystems. And the classic example is uh, sea otters in uh, kelp forests. So the sea otter is essentially a top predator, but he keeps the sea urchins in check. because And if it's not there, the sea urchins eat all the kelp and the entire ecosystem is gone. Hmm. And we yeah. find examples yeah. of that with like wolves in Yellowstone and lots of other places where the presence of the top predator increases biodiversity. And so we could talk about the nutrient cycling that happens there. So some of that feels designed to me, right? And it yeah. feels like, yeah, that there's the system is is adapted or has been changed in order to account for the fact that we now have death and stuff uh, in 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 the world, right? So that's one idea. Hmm. Um, the next idea is um, what we call. Let's see, where is it here? Yeah, corruption by Satan. So maybe we do see some things that are designed, but maybe they're designed by evil agencies, not by God. Um, so, yeah, it's one we came up with. I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, I, I guess it raises some questions, like how much uh, power does, let's say, Satan have in our world to be able to yeah. do things like that? Uh, <clears throat> some things, you know, just seem like snake fangs, right? So that whole venom apparatus and a pit viper. Yeah. Does seem designed, uh, especially when you consider that there's design detail to the point where the venom in the gland has been de-weaponized. In other words, in the snake's gland, it is not toxic. Yeah. Um, one of the one of the mechanisms they use, they actually have acid secreting cells in the gland that reduce the pH, and that's one of the what's one of the ways to keep the wep the the toxins in there inactive until they enter your body. And then there's all the fangs and there's accessory glands yes, yeah. that some people theorize might help weaponize the venom from the gland before it gets injected into you. And you've got this whole swiveling part of the front of the skull and folding fangs that are really long. And it's like, wow. Um, so is, you know, is this the is demonic agencies, do they have the power to alter life to that degree? Um, so that's another one. Uh, the other one we had was what we called mask design. Uh, this would be where sort of God and his wisdom knew that uh, bad stuff was coming, that humans would sin. And so he sort of built into the genetic diversity of the organisms prior to the fall, this ability to adapt quickly. So all of the necessary sort of genes are already present. And then when sin enters, they quickly change and switch over to those new genes. And now we have, you know, parasites and predators and things like that. But in the garden, it's different, right? So we expect in, uh, you know, we see in Genesis, they're not carnivores. Everything's supposed to be eating plants, right? Right, yeah. And so uh, the idea there would be that in the garden, they're different morphology. They're adapted to eating a plant and then... But the genetics are already in place for them to shift over, right? So that would be masked design. Mm -hmm. um, we put another one there called unmasked design. 
which seems to be the one represented in every kid's book showing a picture of Eden, <laughs> yeah. right? Oh, yeah. This is the one where everything already has its predatory adaptations already in place. So, you know, it's usually, I don't know, I've seen pictures where it's like, there's Adam and Eve, and there's this well-placed tiger right in yes. front of them that's covering certain parts of the anatomy that we don't want children to see. Uh, but it's a full tiger, right? It's got the claws, it's the right shape, it's, you know, got the teeth and everything. Um, and that even extends to some of the other animals, right? So you see a deer, a deer's an herbivore, but there's things you, I don't know, there's things, if you're going to explain predators, it seems like you need to explain some of the counter adaptations that herbivores use to escape the predators, sure. right? Yeah. The lateral facing eyes on a deer are for, you know, greater field of vision to potentially see a predator coming. And so, yeah, in those pictures, everything looks like, you know, it is a modern animal, but it's in an Edenic environment where it's all supposed to eat plants. Um, that one, I think, is a bit of a stretch. I don't know how you get, you know, a plant eating tiger. It seems like you need different things to eat plants than you need to eat meat, right? Or catch prey. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure I like that one too much. And then the other one was just natural processes. Uh, so is there a situation where God initially creates, but then its natural processes take over, some kind of evolution takes over and alters animals to uh, their current kind of predatory forms? Um, and yeah, I guess we can try and, I don't know, pull in some evolutionary theory there. Um, but yeah, I guess we can talk about some of that. Yeah, I mean... But how much, how much of, I guess the question, so, you know, I teach to origins classes here at Southern. Um, and we do, I do get the privilege of get to, getting to talk about, you know, all of this, right? I'm not limited in what I can talk about. We can talk about creationism. And so I usually say from a creationist model, there are, it's not so much creation versus evolution as it is how much evolution and what kind of evolution, right? So there is some sort of, you know, diversity within, let's say, a created kind or something like that which you kind of can trace to a common ancestor. So we're looking for how, what's the limit, right? Sure. But then there's also this question of does evolution from a creationist perspective work in the same way as the standard, you know, modern Darwinian approach, right? right, right. And sure. so could there be some natural processes in, <clears throat> involved here that could, you know, change organisms? So yeah, those are the, those are the, I think it's five of them. Yeah, yeah. those are five. Yep. Um, so, yeah, so thinking about, <clears throat> it seems to me that this is not a, that these, these options aren't one size fits all. We don't have to look for one to explain everything that there might be, there might be different options operating in different circumstances so that it's sort of eclectic across the board and you never quite know. I think about especially the natural processes when we're talking about um, things like um, uh, pathogens, right? So the way we have these emergent diseases today, um, COVID, for example, the way you have mutations happening that just happens to make them more e easier to mm -hmm. spread or whatever like that. And so there seems to me, you know, if I think about this, there seems to be like a Oh, places where there are certain options that are more appropriate than others. But when we think about rattlesnakes, I, I, I really struggle with, and, and now I struggle even more knowing what you've told me about rattlesnakes here. It, it, they don't seem to be some sort of random mutation and natural selection process to produce rattlesnakes in a very short amount of time. Right. The, the venom injection is incredibly complex and, you know, it's not weaponized in the snake and it's weaponized in the body. And then the infrared, the heat sensing pits, and then being able to smell in stereo which way your prey went after you bit it. This is not, <laughs> that is an elaborate <laughs> array of, mm. of adaptations or, or, um, uh, features attributes that allow you to be a hunter and to hunt. So, so I would say, would you, would you would you agree with that? That you sort of you we're gonna kind of probably rule out 
Well, it depends. Like Again, it depends vote. what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Let, let me give you a couple uh, ideas. Now, I guess on one hand, yes, I, the, the venom apparatus on a rattlesnake, right? Just the folding fangs and the muscles around the gland and the fact that the venom in the gland seems like isn't weaponized yet and all that stuff that, that, you know, that seems designed, right? Right. Um, on the other hand, there are things about the venom toxins themselves that seem to maybe fit like a, like kind of a natural process scenario. Um, so let me give you an example. So I think I told you before, when I got bit, a red diamond rattlesnake um, tended to make my blood stop clotting, right? And that was the major effect. Uh, the toxins that do that are called snake venom metalloproteases, mm -hmm. which is a big fancy word, but yeah. Um, it turns out that uh, when you look into, let's say, standard evolutionary literature to figure out where these toxins come from, invariably what they say is it was some other protein in the body got what we call co-opted, yep. right, mm -hmm. and put in a venom gland. And yeah, so in the snake, in the case of snake venom metalloproteases, they're related to this other group of proteins, common proteins in the body that seem to have this interesting function. So they're called atoms which is a disintegrin and metalloprotease together, what they do is they sit on the membrane of a cell. And when you're in certain cells, when your cell uh, produces a new receptor, so receptors are kind of those things that uh, cells use to you know, sense the world. They use them to communicate with other cells. So when some molecule binds to it, the cell does something, right? And um, when they produce them, they embed them in their cell membrane and for some of these receptors, they seem to have a little cap on them, so they're not yep. functional yep. quite yet. Yep. Yep. And so these atom proteins have this uh, feature where that they have, I don't know, it's a little something that reaches over and can clip off that cap, and so now the protein is functional. Right. Right. So it's a, it's a protease, so it's a, yep. an enzyme that breaks apart protein. Yep. Well, if you essentially, those snake venom metalloproteases are kind of like if you take that atom protein and you pull off the pieces of that protein that enable it to uh, stick in the cell membrane, you essentially now have a snake venom metalloprotease. And so it's this process of, you know, if you, if you imagine, you know, a perfect world where we're using these atom proteins and that's part of normal development in order to produce these receptors on cells. And then through some process, you're actually reducing information over time. Let's say after synergies, we knock off those uh, parts of the protein that's embedded in the cell membrane. And now we just have the kind of the metalloprotease part that runs around and chews on proteins, right? Mm -hmm. And now we sort of change things. And this is not so much a genetic change as... A change just to say, don't express this, you know, protein in these cells. Express it in a venom gland, right? Which is essentially an analog of a salivary gland. Mm -hmm. Now that protein can just has that parts that chew on things, and now if it gets injected into your system, it'll go chew on the parts that make your blood clot and yep. it's stop that process. Yep. And so you could see, I don't know, I see maybe two sides, like the venom apparatus yeah. itself seems very complicated, and seems designed, but if I'm just re-expressing a protein and knocking off a few pieces, that seems to be something that natural processes might be able to do after the fall. Sure. And I would, and I would add to that, we've got the variability of venom as well. We don't have, rattlesnakes are not producing all exactly the same venom, so. Right, there's lots of different stuff, yeah. That seems like That's a thing a, that could very easily be one of those natural process changes as well. Right, and you, you find that for all of them. So there's P, you know, phospholipase A2, these are the neurotoxins yep. in rattlesnakes. There are phospholipases in other cells that do all That's kinds right. of stuff, yep. right? Phospholipases um, that are uh, secreted into your small intestine for for digestion. So yeah, they can be digested or yes, yeah, so there's has well. to do. Yeah, you know, there's smooth muscles have phospholipases for like signaling. They, yep. Yeah, there's all kinds That's of right. stuff. Yeah, all sorts of things. Yeah. Okay, so we can't rule that out entirely, but it has to be something that is applied very specifically. Yeah. Um, natural processes. Yeah, that's a good point. Now the the idea of <laughs> I generally don't bring this up, but you brought it up, so let's talk about it. 
demonic, okay. demonic uh, genetic engineering or whatever you want to call it, <laughs> demonic right. changes. Um, I, you know, people ask me this all the time. They ask, I can't tell you how often I get asked, could, could the devil have made this happen? And could this be the devil's work? And uh, on the one hand, I have no idea, and I guess I can't rule it out. But on the other hand, I look around, for example, at, like you say, most of these snakes are going out eating rodents, and I know if they don't eat rodents, we're going to get overrun with vermin, so go snake. I love snakes. Come snakes, hang out in my house. I love that. Um, my wife and I are always greeting our snake uh, friends outside. Oh, hello, snake. Come come and eat vermin. That's good to hear. Yeah. Treat those snakes well. Yeah, I we think treat them cool. well. Yeah. So, so, uh, so, yeah. I mean, I don't have anything in the Bible that would tell me that the devil is going around modifying biology. So, wh- what? What do you what what's your gut take on this? What's your gut reaction to this whole the devil the devil's modifying creatures? What do you think about that? Boy, I <laughs> I have a, I guess I have a tough time. I personally, I mean, that's the thing with like the first few chapters of Genesis, you know, it it gives you this nice outline yep. of what happened. Yep, and that's it. But there's a lot of details that you wish the Bible writers would have filled in that we just don't have. Um, I guess we, in, in the paper that, you know, I, you know, we pulled these from that hopefully will be published soon. Um, I think we listed as a possibility, uh, I, th- as we, as we, um, I guess it's one, it's hard to sort of generate evidence to try and distinguish. I think one of the things you might be able to do yes. is, is try and decide which of these features you think are designed and which ones aren't. You know, so if you go back to some of this intelligent design theory, we have, you know, Michael Behe's idea of irreducible complexity. And so you might be able to, you know, make some assessment based on that, whether you think this structure is designed or not. But outside of that, you know, how would you tell if a feature was designed by a demonic power designed by God? I don't know how exactly to go about doing that. Um, I guess maybe some of the things I was talking about before in terms of like how ecosystems function and seem they function better in the presence of parasites and predators at least in our modern situation um maybe that says something more about like a uh, uh, design by god just because it's designed to be sustainable it's designed to you know circulate nutrients through the system and whatever else and i you almost feel like or at least i almost feel like if it was a demonic design and the um maybe you expect demons to be or satan himself to be more malevolent i just want to destroy things yeah more spiteful mm. as opposed to make a system that's sustainable that moves nutrients through to to, to sustain other things yeah 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 um you 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 so, would expect yeah. you would expect that if it was some kind of demonic or satanic design it would it would be inherently sort of destructive and negative um rather than helping to sustain ecosystems in a fallen world. Right. And, uh, you know, it, it just, to me, it just seems to attribute so much creative agency, you know, to the powers of darkness that, I, yeah, I, I find difficult to, to credit, really. Yeah, and I think that's the problem people might have, is how much power do you give Satan to be able to affect these changes in the natural world? Um some of that, I mean, I mean, the other thing we could go down a rabbit hole in is is what I think is an amazing venom delivery apparatus is the stinging cells in jellyfish. Oh yeah, this yeah. Is, yeah. Oh, yeah. Those you might be able to get more down to the molecular level and say this looks like irreducibly complex on the order of yeah. what Behe talks about for yeah. uh, you know at the bio you know molecular level. Um, that seems amazing design with those things and. I have a hard time thinking that, you know, demonic power, Satan himself has that amount of, of power to be able to mess with nature to that degree. Yeah. I I have a question. I have a question. Um, it kind of arises from some of the, some of this conversation, uh, and it concerns, um, 
So what do we know about the baromenology of snakes? Uh, are all the rattlesnakes members of the same created kind? I, I kind of assume that they are. Uh, I think they're all part of a subfamily. Um, it, if they are, you know, do all members of that kind have all of these traits? You know, do they all have rattles? Do they all have the venom apparatus? You know, um, so it's kind of interesting, I think, to look at the baromenology and see, see um, how much these features vary within the group. Now, I don't know the answers to any, any of that, but that, that might be one way to begin to approach yeah. some of these questions, yeah. perhaps. Yeah. That yeah, is, has anybody yes, done I've sort pheromonology of, I've on that? I've sort of played around with it a little bit, not much. But yes, you do have venomous and non-venomous members of the same great kind. You have members um, with uh, a variety of uh, manifestations of venom injection. You have, you have snakes with grooved teeth instead of hollow fangs. You have, um, you have what are essentially salivary glands that secrete nasty things that don't really attach to the, the, the teeth directly. Um, yeah, there's quite a lot of ver variability there. And yeah. And so the question then would be, which direction is it going? Right. You start with the, with the sophisticated design, like a rattlesnake and lose it in certain species, or do you start without it and gain it in rattlesnakes? Cause if you gain it in rattlesnakes, well, now you've got another layer of complexity, right? Of, all right, well, mm -hmm. <laughs> how do you gain a beautiful design like that? It, it, yeah, it becomes challenging. But unfortunately, Fascinating. we're going to have to deal with that one on a future episode because we are out of time. So thank you so much, Aaron, <laughs> for joining us. This has been it was fascinating. A pleasure to be here. Yeah. You were right. I don't know much about rattlesnakes, and that was... <laughs> And that was fascinating, and I hope our audience has enjoyed uh, hearing and learning about the, the rattlesnakes. And um, so, uh, next time, I'm not sure what our next episode is going to be, but I hope you'll join us back again in two weeks. And uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. And don't forget to, you know, like and subscribe and all that good stuff. That helps us out tremendously. And we will see you next time. See you then. Thanks for listening to this episode of Let's Talk Creation. For more information, visit us at letstalkcreation.org, where you'll find an archive of past episodes in all our show notes. If you'd like to leave a comment or make a suggestion, you can find us on all the major social media platforms. Let's Talk Creation is brought to you in the U.S. by Core Academy of Science and in the U.K. by Biblical Creation Trust. As a listener-supported ministry, we are grateful for all of your financial support. Find out how you can make a contribution at our website, letstalkcreation.org. Also remember to like, subscribe, and share this episode with your friends. Thanks, and see you next time.